morning. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, nice to see that you all came here this early. Um, today's industry talk is uh, about documentary theater. And uh, we have two very interesting uh, filmmakers and theater makers. And uh, I would like to give you a warm welcome to our moderator, Pamela Cohn. She's a writer, curator, and friend of ITFA. So welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so um, joining me today are two incredibly prolific uh, filmmakers, but also theater makers, writers, thinkers. Um, Brian Hill, whose 2007 film, The Not Dead, is playing here as part of the playing reality strand, this wonderfully curated uh, special focus program here at IDFA, and uh, Roberto Torre, whose new film, Le Favolose, The Fabulous Ones, is in this strand as well, but the film is also in competition for the Envision Award. Um, please give them a warm welcome. So just, I wanna foreground the conversation first of all so there isn't any confusion. Um, this discipline of drama therapy, something I'm deeply interested in, I just wanna make it, it clear here, I'm not using it in, in the technical therapeutic sense necessarily, but as a tool to enhance storytelling. Um, using the power of theatrical elements to facilitate and bring forth the true essence of a person appearing before a camera lens. And as you'll see in the clips we'll be able to show and in the background work of these two artists, how that makes for riveting cinema, how they turn this into a beautiful film, a beautiful piece of theater. Um, so this practice has evolved in documentary for as long as the genre has been around. But um, today we'll have an opportunity to really go in, in, in a little bit of a deeper detail as to how this works with protagonists, with scripting, um, with you working as a director trying to orchestrate something very fragile, in fact. Um, but before we dive into the conversation in earnest, I thought we would start with two clips from the films I just mentioned, um, Brian's The Not Dead and Roberta's Le Favolose, just to give you some kind of visual context for what these, these filmmakers are doing. So if we could play those first two clips. Into the period of having my second child, I was the one sat there going, "Oh wow, well, that's classic PTSD," because I'd read it on this website, you see. <laughs> and he, he, you know, we kind of switched roles then, because I'm sat there going, and I kind of became his jailer, mother, nurse, and everything else. It wasn't a comfortable role to take, but it was one that was necessary to keep him on an even keel. Fortunately, my wife is one of my biggest saviors. I really couldn't function without her. Not for the fact that I couldn't do anything on my own. She's just, she's everything. You know, I confess my sins, tell her my fears, explain my emotions, share my nightmares. And she doesn't have to understand, she just has to listen. And she does. He, he does care. He, c he cares about, obviously, what has happened to him. He cares about, you know, what he has seen, and in the military, there are blokes who who don't care. They don't, they, you know, they've seen awful things, and they get up and they live a normal life, and they don't care about it. They're the ones that are scary, not Eddie. <laughs> I'm glad I, I stuck with it because I know now that I wouldn't. I don't think I'd ever leave now. I don't think I'd, I don't think there's anything now that I wouldn't stand up and go through with him. After the first phase, after passionate nights and intimate days, only then would he let me trace the frozen river that ran through his face. Only then would he let me explore the blown hinge of his lower jaw and handle and hold the damaged porcelain collarbone and mine and attend the fractured rudder of shoulder blade and finger and thumb the parachute silk of his punctured lung. Only then could I bind the struts and climb the rungs of his broken ribs and feel the hurt of his grazed heart. It's 
skirting along, only then could I picture the scan, the fetus of metal beneath his chest, where the bullet had finally come to rest. Then I widen the search, trace the scarring back to the source, to a sweating and exploded mine, buried deep within his mind, around which every nerve in his body tightened and closed. Then, and only then, did I come close. Io l'ho messa anche in vendita, eh? Eh sì? Ma sì che l'ho messa in vendita, eh, diverse volte, non una sola volta. E ogni volta che veniva qualcuno che si faceva avanti era più forte di me. Niente, non ci riuscivo, non riuscivo non a venderla. Vinta. E in mente, chiaramente, mi veniva Giovanni. Mamma mia, com'era gentile io. Eh, eh c'aveva pure molti soldi. Eh, era ricco, eh, sì, come si diceva all'epoca, i signori che ci facevano mangiare. Quanti <ride> soldi che giravano in quel periodo. <ride> E lui ce l'ha lasciata. E noi ce la siamo goduta. Io ricordo quando sono uscita la prima volta in strada a vendere i fiori. L'8 dicembre 1980, il giorno dell'Immacolata. Eh, nome d'arte. Te lo ricordo il nome d'arte? Iula. Iula. Eh, come Iula di Palma, <ride> la cantante. La Iula e che soldi. Veramente facevi... ci potevamo permettere qualsiasi cosa. C'era molta domanda e l'offerta non era tanta, noi non eravamo tante e quindi, come si dire, ci guadagnava molto. E poi non dimentichiamo che si usciva dagli anni 70, eh. gli anni della rivoluzione sessuale. E la gente era, come dire, voleva cercare, voleva scoprire, aveva bisogno quasi, come dire, di, 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 di rompere i tabù. Non lo so, c'era cioè, questa sensazione, era quello, era. Eravamo ricercate pure dalla polizia. Eh, come ci seguivano. Eh. Io ero sempre seguita dalla polizia. I uomini. Hanno sempre mostrato una faccia e ne volevano un'altra. E ne volevano un'altra. Eh, sì. Noi eravamo gli ammortizzatori sociali dell'epoca. Eh? Eh, perché allora che cosa piaceva? Eh, e allora piaceva il pitingone, venivano da noi perché eravamo favolose, eh, però volevano il pitingone. Eh, sì. Noi dovevamo stare lì a, come dire, a fare o il dramma o lo spettacolo. È vero, sempre eh. sotto i riflettori, eh, perché sì. poco a poco facevi vedere come mangiavi, sì. come no, eh, quelle cose sono... ordinarie di tutti i giorni eh, che no, fanno tutti fanno, quanti, non, non puff, potevamo. cadevi nella non normalità eh. e noi non dovevamo essere normali, dovevamo essere sempre speciali eh. e noi questa specialità eh. gliela davamo. Eh. <ride> Io mi ricordo una frase che diceva che scrisse un, un poeta del, dell'epoca degli anni 70 che si chiamava Alfonso Gatto e lui scrisse una volta eh, alla morte bisogna arrivarci vivi vivi se te lo permettono ma ad Antonia non gliel'hanno mica permesso di arrivarci viva So, Brian, I'll start with you. Um, the Not Dead was your, was your 15th film, I believe. How many films have you made thus far? Close to 50. Uh, I know that. I don't know. I don't count. <laughs> uh, it makes me feel depressed. <laughs> anyway, oh, it should be something you should be quite proud of. Um, <laughs> these damaged individuals all manifesting really intense PTSD. <clears throat> yeah. Um, in various ways, um, from various wars, various generations, various socioeconomic levels. Um, how, did you, how did your practice before inform how you wanted to really work with documentary protagonists in this way, um, partnering here and in many other projects with Simon Armitage, a poet who transformed their stories into glorious verse? which they then recited. Um, tell me a little bit about the process you went through with them in terms of what you wanted to evoke and how it would potentially 
help them in their healing process? Yeah, I mean, as you say, I've made a lot of films with Simon Armitage, who's a poet. Uh, He's now the, the Poet Laureate in the UK, but at the time, we first worked together in 1996, and we made a film called Saturday Night, which was about four individuals and what they do at the weekend. And for that, Simon wrote a, a poetic narration, kind of really the voice of the city, the city of Leeds in, in the north of England. And then we <clears throat> we came to make another film. We wanted to make a film about the, the culture of excessive drinking in, in Britain. And we made a film called Drinking for England. And to do something different in that film, we we collected the stories from our protagonists and I gave those to Simon as interviews, as audio interviews, and he wrote verses based on what he was hearing. <clears throat> and we then gave those verses back to the people and said, do you think this describes your life? Uh, and feel free to change it, by the way. Feel free to add, subtract, reject it altogether. But we think that speaking in verse about uh, about your experiences would be quite powerful. And <clears throat> one woman in the, in that film, she read the verses and she just broke down immediately. And she said, you, you've, you've basically described my life in a dozen verses. And it was so moving. And, and it, it, from that film, really, it made me think about the power of poetry especially when allied with film, because I think they share a similar language. Both film and poetry can express things in a very succinct way. They can compress and amplify emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, that you, you can say something quite complicated by cutting between two images or by a line break in a poem. So combining the two together was, was really powerful, I think. And then when we came to make The Not Dead, I mean, obviously, the, the, there is a, a long history of war poetry in Britain anyway, partly because Britain has a long history of war. going to war yes. and interfering in places around the world that they shouldn't really be in. Uh, so there is this tradition of war poetry, and it felt appropriate you know, to talk about to these three men of different generations who were experiencing really severe mental health issues to try and use that with, and, and when I spoke to them and said, look, I'd like to tell your story partly through poetry, they all said, fine, we'd love to do that because I think one of the things is that, <clears throat> you know, these, these men felt completely disregarded and they had not received any help when they came back from fighting for their country. They'd been, you know, discarded really. <laughs> So for somebody to come along and say, I think your story is so important that I'd like to work with a poet and you to tell that story, I think that was a, a form of validation for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the same process, they could reject the poetry that Simon wrote, they could add to it, they could discuss it and change it, because uh, it's, you know, it's their story after all. Uh, but they all, they all embraced the the project really and all I think got got a great deal from it in the end mm -hmm. and I think I think what you have to do is is explain why poetry you can't just say we want to do it as poetry without explaining why you have to explain as I just talked about how it can really help to express emotion uh, and once they knew that uh, they were fully on board mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and in terms of the way that they would recite the poetry. I mean, what did you feel in terms of, um, was it filmed one time? Was it filmed many times? Did they mem I mean, did they, when I watch all of them reciting the, the poetry, they really are embodying the words. The words seem so meaningful to them. And I think it's a, a way in which they don't have to dredge up, you know, or try to articulate really inarticulatable um, feelings. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what the outcome was in terms of, you know, how they would deliver it in this way, because it's not overly dramatic, but it has a sense of suspending reality for just a moment. Yeah. And it's really beautiful how you sort of balance the, 
the talking head interviews, for want of a better word, when they're talking directly to the camera and when they're reciting poetry. It's almost like they inhabit a version of themselves that they're just meeting for the first time. And I think that's really one of the most more beautiful aspects of the film. Well, I think that's right. I think, I think they are meeting a different aspect of themselves. I think they are meeting a, a kind of version of themselves that may have, may have been had their lives taken a different turn. And I, I believe very much through the work I've done that everybody has a spark of creativity. Everybody has this kind of something buried in them that, that some people manage to get out and some people don't. And I think that one of part of the process is helping people to realize that that creativity. And in working with them, you know, I kind of I spoke to them about about not acting. I don't want them to give great expression to this poetry. I don't want them to uh, try and... Because the power is in the words. Yes. The power is in their words, which have just been rearranged slightly by a poet. Uh, they don't need to be expressive in the delivery, which was good because they're not actors. You know, and in some of the music... You know, I also make documentary musicals, and some of the people we have in those really are terrible singers. They really are. I mean, almost as bad as I would be. Uh, but I don't think that really matters. But they take a chance. They take a chance and they stand up and they make themselves vulnerable by performing. And, and I think, you know, in doing so, I think it makes an audience perceive them differently as well. Mm -hmm. I think, it's, I think it, alters, it's, it's, it alters them, but it also alters the audience perception. Yes, absolutely. And Roberta, I'll, I'll ask you a similar question. I mean, it would be nice to know, I think it took you a while, but once you read the work of Popora, um, the, the woman with the gray hair, uh, tell me a little bit about how you envisioned telling the story of this group of people who went through extraordinary times, who were revolutionaries in their own way, and your vision for, again, the work previous to this, how this informed the way you wanted to set um, or create a world for them where only they inhabit and you know, relate to one another, sharing stories, sharing laughter, sharing memories. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the process of realizing that and how is there a script? Is there an overarching dramaturgy that you're interested in? What is the balance of that and the improvisation of turning a camera on these people to just have them be the fabulous people that they are? So before I, I met them a lot of time, but they, they are not a group before. So this is important because in the film maybe it seems they, they are a group, but I found uh, them one, one per one, una per volta. So I think um, I asked to, to speak with them a lot of time before making uh, the film, and uh, it was the, the time of the COVID, the, the pandemia. So we made uh, some, some reunion on, uh, on Zoom, on uh, digital reunion, and I understand that uh, every one of them has, um, has a, is an actor, is an actor. So um, th they are used to acting, how they say in the film, they, they, they say a lot of time, we are, we are acting in the life. And so I understand that they can, uh, can be uh, acting even during the film. But uh, when I put together each other, um, it became to come some uh, relationship different from before. Mm -hmm. So they become to, be to become a group. And uh, some um, reaction, uh, lo dico questo in italiano perché è più complicato, e, e vennero fuori delle reazioni che io prima non avevo mai verificato con loro. And by, by putting them together, so by creating this uh, group relationship, new uh, feelings, new emotions arose that I hadn't expected before. Quindi, uh, I work on a script, 
on a script uh, that I wrote before, but uh, as I usually do, I put together the script and even the improvisation, because I work a lot of improvisation in, uh, in this film, and usually I work on improvisation. And uh, I uh, shoot in the, a lot of uh, hours, a lot of hours for this film, very, very long uh, time. N not a long time in, uh, in days, but a long time in hours, and in, uh, in quantità di, di, di girato, diciamo, in uh, how, a lot of shooting. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. And uh, I think uh, um, after I have a long, long time to edit, and so in these six months, that six, seven months, I have to edit the film, I understand which kind of, of feeling I can, I can uh, try to brandare in fondo alla storia. To delve better into the story. So the, but the situation of Antonia, this, this uh, and, and how she was um, treated by her family, and so all of this is a world you created. All of this is a world in which you made all of these um, relationships and situations, and then you work with you work with them as actors in terms of performance, or you I, let them improvise based on. I'm just trying it's to like see. It's like a psychodrama. What, hmm? Psychodrama. I mean. Psychodrama. <laughs> like psychodrama. psychodrama. Because but can you define you can can you define what psychodrama is for you? and how it's, how it's part of that process. Okay. This is in Italian because it's difficult. <laughs> so, uh, um, allora, diciamo che tutte loro hanno vissuto una storia come quella del film. Per cui eh, tutte loro hanno conosciuto nella loro vita un'Antonia. E anche se non si chiamava Antonia, però la storia era, era quella. So, each of them has uh, lived a similar story than the one that they are uh, portraying in the film. They all knew uh, one other Antonia. They had one Antonia in their lives, even though she wasn't called that way. Ognuna di loro sapeva bene che cosa voleva dire alla fine della propria vita arrivare ad, ad essere completamente disattese rispetto alla vita che avevano fatto. So each of them had experienced this... Um, this um, Miss expectations of what they wanted their life to be and what they actually experienced at the end of their lives. Quindi il sentimento di quella violenza tutte loro lo conoscevano bene. So they all knew very vividly, very strongly this feeling of violence that has been portrayed in the film as well. Io ho cercato semplicemente di dargli il modo di metterlo in, in acting, cioè di metterlo in scena. My positioning in that is that I created the way, um, I enacted the process through which they um, could put into the scene uh, their own uh, stories. E quando Nicole, per esempio, uh, racconta di... Ognuna di loro racconta il momento in cui l'hanno vista al funerale, ecco, questa scena loro l'hanno vissuta tutte dal vero. For example, the moment, the scene where Nicole recalls the, um, the funeral experience, that is something that uh, they all had in common at some point in their lives. Ognuna di loro ha avuto un'amica che è stata sepolta con abiti diversi da quelli della, del suo genere. Mm -hmm. Each of them experienced actually uh, one of their friends being uh, buried with clothes that do not reflect the gender, uh, the, the way they felt during their lives. Il mio lavoro è un po' quello di dirigere l'orchestra nel momento in cui mettiamo in scena tutto questo. And so my task is to orchestrate all of this, uh, this process, these experiences. Um, but then you have this really beautiful way of lifting everything up into fantasy, into, into a way in which um, they can have a common funeral together because the, the premise is that when a, 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 a trans woman is buried in the clothes of the gender that they don't identify with, they must wander through the afterlife, in other words, forever, in this, in this misfit identity. And it's, I, it's such a beautiful way in which you take the orchestration of that and lift it up into almost a celebration of, you know, the power of them being together 
and the power of them going through that same experience together. Um, I think I see that in all of your work. There's, there's a moment where everything is lifted into, into high theater, you know, into the realm of fantasy. And for me, that's always very beautiful to see that play, you know, because I think in a way that's part of the healing process for them, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if that's part of your agenda or whether this just happens naturally if you make this kind of setting and this kind of space for people to be in. This is a question for both of you, really, um, because there is, a, as Brian alluded, there is this certain vulnerability. Um, but then I think about the ways in which we all sort of act in our daily lives. We're all only showing or hiding what we choose to show and what we choose to hide. But I kind of would love you to talk about the way in which you're breaking form, you're breaking the documentary form, you're breaking any kind of genre form, and realizing really a world unto itself, a sort of circumscribed, stable, safe place to really um, imagine. How does, if you can talk a little bit about why you feel that's so important um, instead of doing a straight documentary, let's say, on or a straight observational <clears throat> approach to characters like this, to protagonists like this. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I, I regard myself as very fortunate in that I did not go to film school uh, because, you know, for a long time, the dogma at film schools, particularly in Britain, was that Verite is the only way to make a documentary. It has to be observational. And I, because I didn't go to film school and because I met people who thought differently, I, I kind of was blessed by being able to explore different ways of making documentaries. And one of the things that I've done, tried to do, uh, not always successfully, but I tried to give people an opportunity to express themselves in a way that... <clears throat> You know, as you said, we, we reveal things, we hide things, and we, you know, we, we let people see what, what we want them to see, all of us. Uh, but I think what the process I've gone through with some of my characters, some of my contributors, is to allow them to show things that they've had to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I think Roberta does the same beautifully. So it's a question of saying, come on, go on a journey with me, and let's find out these things that you want to say. I mean, Cliff, who I think we're going to see a clip of mm -hmm. soon, is, is a man who was 80 years old when I met him, and he'd fought in the British Army in Malaya. Uh, and he'd seen and done terrible things. And he hadn't been able to talk about it, not even to his wife. And when I met him, it was almost as if he'd been waiting for me to come along. Not Not... It, not because I'm anything special. It's just it the was it was it was the opportunity, yeah. and he he met me, and I said, I want to hear about what you've done and what you've seen. I want to hear your story, and I want to be able to help you tell that story in this poetic form. And for him, that was a that was a burden lifted from his shoulders. Finally, he could talk about it, and he could talk about it in a way that he wouldn't be judged, and he wouldn't be uh, condemned for it, even though he's talking about some fairly gruesome things. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it, I, I knew I, he, he just changed him, you know, and, and you know, not, not because I'm particularly brilliant at doing that, but I just, I think it was an opportunity. And I think that's so important. And I think, you know, you can sometimes get at deeper truths in documentary by exploring these other routes into a person's story rather than just pointing the camera at them and letting them go about their daily life. I think I think Roberta did it very well in her film that we've just seen a clip from, that you get these people and you, you explore real truths about their personalities and about mm -hmm. their lives, mm -hmm. which is denied if, you know, in other forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you would also, Roberta, you've, 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 um, you've had such a diverse background, but you actually told me you really started with this almost... Um, rigorous form of drama therapy, working with someone with real communities, with real people, with 
being grounded in this practice of allowing everyday people to move into a more imaginative space. Um, if you would just talk more about that in, in the ways in which that really lifts the stories you want to tell, both in, both in a theatrical setting and on film. Sì, allora direi che in realtà è come una sorta di viaggio nell'immaginario e nella fantasia di ognuno di loro. It is sort of a, a travel within the imagination and the fantasy of each of them. E prima uh, I, I try to understand what they think, what they feel, which kind of imagination they have. And after I, I try to put this in the story. So I be, before I have to know who, who they are, mm -hmm. who they think, who they feel. Maybe sometimes they don't realize what they feel, but I realized if I speak with them. So when I realized, I can uh, cut kept and put in the film. And uh, this is uh, strange because I need always to have uh, um, a, a real story to make a film, always, even when I make fiction. And why, why is that? What, what, is, what is it about being grounded in, in that kind of real life truth, as they say? How, why do you insist on that? That's a very interesting approach. Because maybe uh, I, I, um, I think that the cinema that can change the reality. It's the contrary. <laughs> Sometimes uh, someone thinks that reality is uh, uh, from uh, one side and cinema from another one. I, I think the two things uh, can go together and I, can, I, I think that cinema can change reality really. So it's like a, mag a magician, uh, no? It's like a magia. You you can change. Maybe you can change. Brian is. You can change just for a little uh, moment, mm -hmm. but you can change your reality. Maybe you can feel something different. There is a, th a therapy. It's called uh, Costellazioni Familiari. Mm -hmm. That is a, a therapy that is made um, making uh, sitting people. Uh, and acting a um, different role of his family. Uh, so everyone mm, takes the, the part of uh, one member of the family mm -hmm. and in uh, some way he acts like. And after this therapy everyone is changed because uh, he knows something different from him. I do the same with my girls and I, now or with my other actors when mm -hmm. I put uh, someone in the movie. And there is a trauma, maybe, sometimes, always. And about this trauma I can see what we can work at which kind of feeling we can use it to uh, to work with and to make uh, theater cinema mm -hmm. changing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is um, incredible sometimes to come out some incredible things like brian was saying before yes. uh, the feeling uh, change change the the way of uh, looking at the reality and uh, this is cinema this is cinema. Mm -hmm. Before before we show another clip of, of the works we've just seen, um, I thought it would be nice in, in this um, discussion of breaking form of sort of, or maybe not even breaking form, I would use the word expanding. I think that's, that's a better word. Expanding the possibilities of form, um, of the documentary form, of the cinema form, of the hybrid form, um, and, and the framing therein by playing... Um, <coughs> A, a clip from a new project that you're working on around the coronavirus epidemic, um, which you've turned into a musical. Um, and Roberta, I'd love to show a film from Ricardo Va al Inferno, because here you're using a quite big personality, someone very well known in Italy. Um, and it would be a nice way to discuss the different levels in which people practice the art of acting, whether they are a non-actor, whether they are just an everyday person, 
or whether they are used to this performative mode and how you get underneath you know, all of those layers to really reveal something about that person. So if we could play back-to-back -back clips, the, the second set of clips, that would be wonderful. Nightmares all the time. You can't really sleep. You're thinking of the news every day. You keep hearing the numbers increasing. Day by day, people dying. You're like wondering and waiting for that phone call. Like, yeah, your loved one is gone. A party game for those house arrest evenings, those shapeless weekends. Close your eyes, imagine the virus, then draw what you see. At some point, I stopped sleeping in my room. Sometimes sleep in the living room because on my bed it's just like that's where the demon is. A toy bucket of luminous green slime. A blue golf ball studded with red golf tees launched on the breath. Radioactive pimple jellyfish floating through solid flesh. Blooms of spherical algae or lichens sprouting with broccoli florets. Small planets with suckers, alien life forms with trumpets for lips. That's where the demon is. When I put my head on the pillow, yeah, that's where the monster is. I try to find somewhere I can be safe, somewhere I can hide, but there is no place. The nightmare, the death, the virus. A yellow splodge, a pink splat, a purple splodge. Phosphorescing space invaders crabbing through thin air. Pac-Men chasing innocent blood cells through vital organs and veins. Barbed cartoon emojis fitted with fish hooks and grappling irons. Duckweed clogging the lungs. in a shared house. It's four different families. They go out, they come in, so wait, you don't know when you're touching the staircase, you're in the toilet. We only have one in the bathroom and we all use the same. Do you know what your housemate is doing or where they've been? Everywhere you turn to, you can see the virus, you can see the crown, the image and everything. It's all in your head, it's everywhere you turn to. 100,000. It's hard to compute the sorrow contained in that grim statistic. Invisible tyrant monarch of all countries and kingdoms and realms, wearing the crown, wearing the crown, wearing the black crown. A hundred thousand dead in this country alone. Definitely the virus at this time have ruled over everything your day-to-day -day life, your economy, even your breathing. That's maybe a million years of human life. That's a mile-high, mile-wide milestone seen from a horse-drawn hearse and not the end of the road. It's in your head, whether you like it or not, and yeah, you can demonize the virus. It's got a face with crown and spikes on it. It's round.
che dovete morire i miei nobili signori! So, what we just saw was your adaptation of Richard III. You're, you're taking Shakespeare, you're taking a sort of very solid, <laughs> cultural, you know, iconographic play. Tell me a little bit about why that play in particular was so important to retell. Um, I believe you did it as a theater piece first, and then the film came afterwards, yes? Or did you... Okay. I made it with uh, um, con pazienti psichiatrici prima. With psychiatric patients first. The Richard Hurt with the okay. psychiatric patient. Okay. And after I decided to go on. And um, from that experience, I, put, I try to, to keep something and I put in the film. And I want to, to explore again this, uh, this screenplay. And I try to, um, to take a very, very famous uh, Italian singer, mm -hmm. that is Massimo Ranieri. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a very classical singer, like a crooner. Like a, and uh, in this film, is, is very punk. So for him, for him is a total transformation. I raise her hair, and uh, he has to use her voice in another way. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the, trans the real transformation is about him. So <laughs> it's about strange. About him, him as a person. Yes, because um, uh, I I I feel that he wanted to be different in 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 his life. He never uh, could be different, and he was always a crooner. And mm -hmm. I want him a punk. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> Is is strange <laughs> because I, I feel he has uh, he has this needed to be to be a punk, but he, non aveva il coraggio. But he didn't have the courage to. So I give him the courage, and uh, okay, you can be a punk, uh, Richard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and what was his transformation? I mean, for him, let's say therapeutically or as an artist, even to be able to expand, you know, that very strict way in which most people wanted to perceive him. Um, it, what does this enable someone who, who can have this time and space and this, and this way also to play? I mean, your, your works are very playful. They have a lot of playfulness in them, a lot of color, a lot of, a lot of um, drama, in fact. Um, do you direct those segments as you would? Um, I, I'm just trying to get to like the director hat and the therapist hat. Is there a, how does this kind of work side by side? Maybe there's also a little bit of, uh, I mean, actually not a lot, of, a, a little bit, a lot of risk perhaps. Um, I would just love to hear both of your thoughts on that. This, this sort of maybe potential pitfalls <coughs> let's say, of, of working in this mode? If there are any, I don't know. Yes, there are a lot of risks and not always is, uh, non sempre the result is uh, successful. Right. <laughs> because sometimes uh, one can stop at the first uh, level of um, intention, you know? Because it's not a language that has, um, non è un linguaggio codificato, codificato. Codified, it's not a codified language. language. So every time is a risk, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, is this, I don't know if it's Brian, is the same. Yeah, uh, oh, before I answer that, just, I, I'm coughing, but please don't worry, I haven't got COVID. Uh, I'm just recovering from a chest infection. Uh, I did a test yesterday. Uh, there's always risk with this kind of work <clears throat> because it can go spectacularly wrong. And I, I exist in a state of... Uh, constant kind of anxiety when I'm making a film in this way because it might just be ridiculous. You know, it, it, people may not respond to it. People may think it's, they may not know what it is and they may not get it, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, well, wor it's worth the risk, I think. But the risks inherent, let's say, of also cinematizing something that's quite abstract, mm -hmm. in fact, that's really not 
based around anything. You know, COVID is, is of course, a, a, a real thing that the entire world has dealt with, but as many, you know, human beings on the planet as there are, that's how many stories there are around this mm -hmm. pandemic, around the way they coped. <laughs> Did they lose loved ones? I mean, there's so many entry points, and I wanted to know how... Do you work with a choreographer? Do you, I know you worked with Simon again, but do you work with a choreographer? Do you work with you know, the different tools of theater and how, that, how does that incorporate into the script, into your vision of what it is you want to do? Well, with, with that particular clip that we just watched, I, I met the woman Comfort, uh, who is a, a Nigerian asylum seeker living in a shared house in London with other asylum seekers and, you know, in pretty miserable conditions. Right. And when I met her, uh, I was really struck by her poetic kind of explanation of what COVID was. She, she pictured it as this kind of demon wearing a crown. And of course, Corona is crown. And, <clears throat> and Comfort has had mental health problems and I think they've been hugely exacerbated by COVID. And I, I really wanted to make something of how she was saying this and I wondered mm -hmm. how to do it and and I took a transcript of her interview that I'd done and I <clears throat> started taking bits out and kind of taking the more poetic elements from it <clears throat> and putting it together and then I I said to her, I took it back to her and said would you think you know would you think about performing this on a stage and again she just said yes <laughs> I'd love to and then I just thought, oh, you know, we may as well go crazy with this. Let's really kind of make something of it. So I spoke to a choreographer uh, called Nat Zangi and explained to her what I wanted to do. And she said, OK, I can work with her. So we set up some rehearsals for comfort to work with the dancers. <clears throat> and uh, I found a piece of music by an Icelandic band called Amina. And I got Simon Armitage to write something that would complement and play around Comfort's words. And then just thought, let's let's do it. Let's let's really see see if we can make a big theatrical experience of this, and hopefully then really make Comfort's words have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was the process. So. The question is then, do the stories inform the form? I think you alluded to this earlier, Roberta. The people that you meet, you, you mentioned. So this casting process, if you, how does that happen? I mean, I'm sure it's different for every project, but there's very particular casting that's going on here. Um, casting not only for how they may look and how they may move and but really who the essence of who they are, um, since they're going to be embodying, right, some aspect of themselves on screen. So um, just logistically, how do you, where do you go, for instance, do, where do you begin in terms of your search for the, for the right protagonists in order to enact this? I mean, I'm sure you've approached people maybe who have said, no, no, thank you, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> doing this. Um, or, or do you explain the full scope of what the benefits could be, both theatrically for them, but also therapeutically? Um, if you could just maybe take a, an example of how that might work um, in Les Favolose, for instance, you know, where um, you said you sort of one by one discovered these women. I'm sure it's not a huge pool mm -hmm. of people to choose from, but... How did that? How did that work? Uh, so in the beginning, I understand that they have a lot of um, a sacco di capacità di, di acting, uh, strong interpretative um, interpretative skills. E quando le, le ho viste tutte insieme, ho capito che potevano diventare una compagnia, una vera compagnia teatrale o comunque cinematografica. And once I saw them uh, together, interacting together, I immediately thought that they could become a, a, cinematograph a group in a cinematographic or theatrical way. 
ma eh, quello, che, quello che ho capito è stato quando le ho viste veramente tutte insieme perché una per volta non era così cioè la, la cosa forte è stata quando le ho messe tutte insieme sono diventate un gruppo e ho capito quali interazioni tra di loro potevano essere drammatizzate But it is um, only when I saw them all together that I, that I reached this, uh, this revelation. So by seeing them together acting as a group, um, I, could, um, I immediately understood which interactions between them could be dramatized. E questo poteva essere anche un modo per uscire dai cliché che, tut, che questa condizione eh, di transizione si porta sempre dietro. Il, la, la condizione di transizione è sempre vista con, come qualcosa di pittoresco, di folcloristico, nella mm. maniera, eh, nell'accezione negativa, invece io volevo raccontare la loro vera vita. And this is a way through which I, I also um, managed to, uh, I think that I managed to uh, get out from the cliches, from this uh, uh, pictor uh, picturesque, folkloristic uh, representation that is usually attributed to this trans transitory condition um, and to, um, to, to reach uh, the true essence of, uh, of what they were. La verità è che nella realtà ci sono dei momenti di gran teatro e non, vole, non voglio mai perderli. The truth is that uh, reali the, the, the reality um, the truth is that the reality is made of many um, moments of, uh, of, the uh, of theater and this is what I don't want to lose. Could you, could you expand on that thought? La realtà è, una, come dire, un grande, è, una grande, è un grande serbatoio di possibilità per il teatro e per il cinema e in qualche modo io lo vedo nella vita di tutti i giorni, in everyday life, I, I see cinema and I see theater. E, probabilmente questa cosa va vista con una forma di distanza, è la giusta distanza che io cerco sempre attraverso le storie che racconto, perché basta avvicinarsi poco e questa realtà diventa reale, basta allontanarsi un po' e diventa teatro o cinema. Ed è questa distanza che fa la differenza. Um, I feel the reality as a great... Um Uh, a great uh, incubator of um, possibilities for theater and cinema in everyday life. Um, I think it is um, as reaching the, the right distance between uh, getting closer to them uh, and making them reality, but also getting a little bit, going a little bit backwards and then making them theater and cinema. Quello che io faccio è cercare un è come vedere tutto questo attraverso un caleidoscopio e metterlo in scena, cioè io faccio la forma di tutto questo. Uh, I am um, looking at, at, this, uh, at all of this through a um, caleidoscopic and I'm the one that makes a form out of all, all the synergies that I see around them. E per concludere loro dicono nel film una frase importantissima che è noi tra il delirio e il dramma abbiamo sempre scelto lo spettacolo e direi che questa è una frase manifesto di questo di cui stiamo parlando. And there is a, um, a very important sentence uh, in, during the film where one of the characters says uh, because we, uh, between delirium, between craziness and drama, we decided to, uh, to, to, to make spectacle, to make theater. And this is, I think, it's, it's, a, very, um, it's a very good sentence to, to sum up um, my, my, uh, my vision of theater in relation to reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I, let's. Do you have anything else to add to this? Because I thought we no. would, we would once again give you a little bit of, of a glimpse um, to one of Brian's protagonists, um, Cliff, the elder gentleman who fought in Malaya, um, and and give you a glimpse of him. Um, Cliff has since passed away, and you told me he he was buried with a copy of the film. <laughs> Is that true? He was. Uh, <laughs> I think for Cliff, it was a, a really big thing for him to do the film. That's a very moving and thing. And it was a very, uh, very important for him. And, and he was very proud of 
what he'd done. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we, yeah, we arranged that. Mm-hmm. And and this scene from Le Favolose is is there exactly this sharing of memory, maybe the more painful aspects of their past, the the tender stuff that they also reveal to you in in a very, that's where the vulnerability is, you know, um, because the way, the space in which to tell those very painful stories, again, being framed so beautifully and also being part of a chorus of voices, you know, that have experienced not the same thing, but but something similar. So if we could play those two next clip, next clip, excuse me, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Our sort of eyes met, and he put his hand up like that. And I knew that if either me or the other two would have opened the eyes to move him, would have been killed. So I just, I just rolled right over his head and I killed him. And I've got him to face in the near future. Me and Lomas and a Polish bloke, we sat and thought, whispered and smoked, men without rank, men on their own, one road out, one road home. So we drove back into the killing zone, just drove right into the killing zone. River still rolling, turning its stones. Mates I drank and laughed and joked with. Mates I deft and jeffed and smoked with. I butchered now, and their shirts are burning. River still writhing, river still turning. Joe with his eye shot out of his head. He lived for now but meet his end in a Manchester doorway begging for bread. River runs black, river runs red. Some boy wailing his mother's name. Tommy's asleep with a hole in his brain. I found his killer and shot him dead. Tossed him onto a barbed wire fence. Taught him a lesson, left him to rot. Job done. That brain was absolutely disgusting, barbaric. But then, it didn't affect me one little bit because he and his crew had shot and killed my, my, my friends. So, in... In 1952, the fact that he'd been thrown over the bar wire didn't bother me one little bit. But it bothers me now, because he was somebody's son. He might have been somebody's husband, he might have been somebody's brother. And he tried to kill us, and we had to kill him. I didn't even know him, he didn't even know me. And that's that's the sad part about all this. Job done. Till 30 years on. When the dead, like the drowned, float up to the top. One road out, one road in. And all for what? Rubber and tin. A bicycle tyre and a can of beans. And a river that streams and streams and streams. Certi ricordi cambiano con il tempo, si trasformano, altri si cancellano completamente.
a mia madre, l'infarto le venne, le dissero, signora, ma Sofia sta bene. E solo che ha una disforia, cioè eh, probabilmente Sofia diventerà sua figlia. E quindi calato il separio, calato i sogni di mia madre. Non ne posso parlare. Non ne posso parlare. Perché un ricordo molto presente su, sulla pelle. Io mi ricordo quando ero piccolo e mettevo la mia testa sulle sue gambe mentre lei era seduta, così sto per, mentre gli altri parlavano a tavola, io sentivo il suo odore molto forte delle sue parti, cioè forte nel senso era quello, forte per me perché lo riconoscevo subito e lei mi ha sempre amato, poi siamo passati in quella fase in cui lei ha solo cercato di proteggermi usando, essendo molto dura con me perché mi voleva, in qualche modo voleva proteggermi perché sapeva che la famiglia di mio padre mi stava col fiato addosso tant'è vero che una volta è arrivato mio cugino il più grande dei miei cugini che ora non c'è più mi ha preso la testa tra le gambe e con le forbici a zig zag mi ha stretto perché così non potessi muovermi mi ha tagliato tutti i capelli mia madre non mi vedeva da tre anni e mi sono presentata nella sua tintoria, perché la madre aveva una tintoria appunto a tre castagni. E entro dentro con questo cappotto nuovo, c'era ancora l'etichetta, e dico signora mi può smacchiare questo cappotto? E mia madre prende questo cappotto e dice ma signorina mi dispiace ma è anche nuovo, c'è l'etichetta. E io dico mamma, mia madre in quel momento alza lo sguardo e dice ah! Corre verso le serrande, tira giù le serrande, mi prende, mi sbatte nello sgabuzzino, chiude la porta e dice che ci fai qua? <ride> non mi aveva riconosciuta. E lei, la mia mamma, mi disse ah, beata te che adesso tu sei libera di essere ciò che vuoi. Perché lei ancora stava con quell'uomo lì che la picchiava, la, in qualche modo la, la, la maltrattava, no? E quindi lei vedeva in me quella, quella libertà che lei non aveva potuto vedere. E mamma... Mi abbracciò e mi disse, sono contenta che tu sia riuscita a scegliere la tua vita. I'd love for you also each to talk about, um, I think the, the, the frame of cinema and the frame of, or the different frames of moving image and the way in which you can story tell What are the limitations of cinema, if any, for this form? I mean, what are your encounters with coming up against, not, not, the, moral, not the moral values of what's happening necessarily, but, but maybe the, the limits of that storytelling? I mean, we're talking about expansive storytelling, breaking form, you know, theatricalizing um, real stories, etc. cetera. But... Um, I'm just asking this question because you are incorporating so many other creative forms within the cinema space, but we're still looking at a two-dimensional um, screen, if you will. Um, and I'm just sort of interested in knowing how you might expand upon this practice, either within the confines of cinema or wanting to go outside the cinematic space, perhaps and still carry on this documentary work, but in, on stage, in virtual reality, perhaps, um, in the ways in which we're now able to encounter a more 3D experience with, with, this kind of, with these kinds of stories. Does that interest you at all? Does that, um, does that have possibilities for you? Or are you really trying to, to keep pushing what the possibilities of a cinematic piece can do? Uh, uh, I, I, I'd, I'd still like to push what we can do in a 2D form with cinema because I, I don't think we've explored all the possibilities yet. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I'm very, I, I, I have to say with VR, I just don't get it. 
<laughs> maybe too old and too set in my ways, but I've seen lots of VR films and I just don't get, I don't understand it. I don't, don't see why. What are, what are the limitations <clears throat> of, because, you know, supposedly it is actually supposed to create more intimacy and to create more of a profound, you know, sensorial effect on your body. I mean, because I find, you know, there's a lot that happens to our bodies in the cinema space. I mean, we don't necessarily recognize that as such because we're usually sitting still and facing one direction and watching something, but it is a very visceral thing to, to, to encounter all of these emotions and evocations that a film can bring up. But it's a different supposition altogether. You know, I think in VR, you, you are kind of, I always feel ungrounded. I feel mm. like I don't, my perspective is, um, I don't know, I, it makes me feel like I'm losing agency more than having more agency in yeah. terms of getting in touch with my emotions and my reactions to what it is I'm seeing. I agree, I feel distanced by it. And I, I also feel uncomfortable sitting there with this headset on. Uh, and not being able to kind of access what's around me in, in the real world, so I, I don't like it. Uh, I'm very interested in theatre and 3D and exploring documentary forms on the stage. Uh, and I'm currently working with two theatre groups in London, uh, talking about you know some projects together. Uh, I think that's really exciting, and for me, you know, certainly in London where I live, the the most radical work is being done in theatre. Mm -hmm. The most interesting work is being done in theatre. Uh, the most interesting kind of storytelling is being done through theatre. So yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Mm -hmm. I, am, I agree with Brian, because I'm, I'm a woman in the 19th, 900, how do you say? 20th century. 20, uh, I'm the woman from a 20th century, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I have to explore more my my century <laughs> because and the cinema too. No, I, I I feel uncomfortable too with the 3D with the virtuality because I think it's another kind of uh, of language. It's, it's a quite a dif different language, not uh, not the same for, from the cinema. Mm. I, I am very curious about all the language, so I think it could be nice. Maybe, uh, yes, for the theater, for example, is uh, different. But um, for the, I, I think it's a, it's a quite different uh, feeling of taste. So I, I'm... I don't understand yet how to use, uh, and, and I don't know if I am interested, uh, really interesting in use it now. Mm -hmm. um, I always uh, mixed uh, a lot of um, of support in the the, the, the 35 millimeter, super hot, and something like that. So I think the cinema has a lot of uh, things to be explored again mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. going uh, out of this square. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know really if it's um, useful or not for my language. Maybe someone else can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's all about storytelling, isn't it? I think, and I think that's what we often forget in documentary that we're we're telling stories. And I think some people think that it's just enough to witness something and bear witness to something. Uh, and it's interesting that in the United States. Uh, Fiction films are often referred to as narrative films, and I guess the corollary of that is that documentary is non-narrative and doesn't have stories, and I'd argue that it does, uh, and it's all about storytelling, and I just think it's with the particular subject or with the particular contributor finding the best way to tell that story. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what are they interested in? What do they want to do? What are their talents and skills? And how can we harness those to tell their particular story? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think that's why so many uh, kind of big name fiction directors, when they decide to make a documentary, they often make a real hash of it because they don't understand that you've got to still tell a story, albeit in a different way. Mm -hmm. and, and then what does that give to the viewer? You know, because I always feel in a sense grasping the narrative or grasping the story is actually the easy part. 
the hard part is, I think, having access to that or feeling like you have access to that. And I think through the clips with, that we've seen and the way in which you work with your protagonists, there's so much room for the spectator too because the way you can authentically, it's such a contrived thing to put various people in various situations. Um, but when you're raising it to a level of play and drama, to me, there's something very innately moving about that. I mean, even again, having someone stare at the camera and recite poetry to talk in a sort of elevated language, but in a very almost colloquial way. And I think this is Simon's real genius, is that he has a way of not, of not you know, poetry can be very lofty, but yet he's always keeping it in, in, the, in the very grounded space of colloquial language, of the way we really communicate. Um, what, is, what are your current preoccupations then with trying to, you alluded to working with theater companies, but what are your current preoccupations now as an artist, as continuing to expand upon this? What, what, are, what are your dreams and, and imagination telling you where to go next? I mean, are you, in other words, is this taking of, I think with Les Favolose, there's some also, I don't know, this leap in your filmography somehow, because you've created um, a cinematic piece that's just this beautiful, we're always talking about this hybridity, but to me, this film in particular, captures what that hybrid, the possibilities of that hybrid in a, in a very superb way. Because my litmus as a cinema goer is always what is it doing, is it moving me? It's not that I'm fascinated by their stories necessarily or about who they are, but this energy that you create between them is transcendent. You know, that's, that's what sort of lifts everything um, into a real work of art. So is this mode of working um, something you might attempt again with another group of people? Or do you want to then go back to a more theatrical setting where lights and camera and costumes and this more, you know, um, passion play, if you will, um, feeling is there? I'm just curious to know, um, what, what your preoccupations are now after making Les Favolose and having such success with this, this way of, of no, making I'm, an ensemble together. I'm working together. on a new film that is uh, uh, Mi fanno male i capelli, it's called from the phrase from Monica Vitti, uh, Deserto Rosso, Antonioni. So about this, uh, this speech on the Abri date, I took, um, is the story of a woman that lose her memories and uh, find herself in the characters of uh, um, Monica Vitti's uh, films. And I try to put the, the actress in, um, in dialogue with the repertory of the film of Monica Vitti, all the film, so Deserto Rosso, La Notte, all the film of Antonioni, even the comedy. And um, it's very strange because when I start to work at this film, uh, Monica Vitti died. Um. So uh, now, when I, when I see her uh, sp uh, speaking with the Monica Vitti on the screen, I see a seduta spiritica. Like, like a spiritual reenactment? Because she answers us and she speaks with her. So it, this, uh, this is about the, the answer, uh, the, the, the question you, you make me, how do you feel now? What do you want to, to, to go? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a, a new journey because I've, I've found a, a strange way to communicate with, um, with the repertory, for example. And so uh, there is a, a, lang a new language that is coming out. Because the repertory is it's just not something you put in the film, but you can make it alive. And you can make it speaking with us. 
So the, the feeling is very strange. Uh, apart the the film, I don't know how it will be will good or not or less good. But in any case, this kind of language is a, is something that I I discover with a lot of. Uh, um, happiness because I found a new language for uh, speaking with uh, someone there is not anymore mm -hmm. uh, but there are their film and so they can speak with the old movies it's, it's beautiful for example so it's like a 3D you, know, you can come in the film like uh, how, do you, how do you feel the, the, the name of that film of Woody Allen story is uh, Rosa Pulpuria del Cairo but now we have to do with the, the real film. Uh, and the, the, the things, the sad things that she has died uh, make it seem uh, more incredible because uh, it's like she was there when she speak with us. Mm -hmm. It's strange. Mm -hmm. and, and are you going to do any kind of... So it, it's more dialogic, in other words. Are, will you have all the trappings as well? of a set and, a, and the way, you know, you, you have a beautiful talent for choreographing too with the camera. Um, and I feel also too, like with the choices you make in your editing as well, it's all in a bid to bring us closer to who it, we're encountering on the screen. And even though, you know, the practice of documentary is supposedly just that, there, I'm just trying to reveal maybe the, um, the un if you can un articulate the unspoken language that happens between you and a protagonist when you're directing someone like that. You have a vision, you want to realize that vision. Can you give an example of, of the challenges of, of not simply saying, well, let's try this and see how it works, but expressing your own vision for what you want to realize in the film? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to uh, work from the, for, from the basic principle that they're not actors, and therefore they're not trained as actors, and they don't know how to act. <clears throat> and they're not singers, because in the musicals I've made, you know, if I, if I was working with actors, then I would, you know, direct them very carefully, and, you know, because I work in fiction as well, so I, you know, I, I know how to work with actors, and I know how to work with uh, non-actors, or real people, as I prefer to call them and and I think you know I'm thinking about the film I made called Songbirds where we had these musical sequences <clears throat> and I explained to one of the the women one of the inmates uh, about this you know the way that I wanted to shoot her particular song and she listened to me and she went no <laughs> no we're not doing it like that I want to do it like this and I said okay you you go ahead so you do have to give up some directorial yeah, agency. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And that's fine because you're inviting them in to be co-creators in a way. So you can't have barriers to that. You can't say this co-creation only goes a certain distance, you know, because I'm the director and I'm in charge. No, I think you have to be really open mm -hmm. and say we're doing this together. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe when we work uh, with the non-actor, um, me too, uh, I, I have to, to understand uh, um, which kind of possibility they have uh, before. And after, uh, there is a, like a, a ring where they have to, to do uh, free, real free. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything is between the distance, I repeat, uh, where you can uh, direct them and the, the, the moment, in other ways, you have to, to let them free because there is something irre um, irrepetible. It cannot be uh, repeated, it cannot be and performed And this is again. very precious. This is yes. that moment you have to catch. Uh, is uh, not repeatable. It's like uh, here and now and not anymore. <laughs> so right. It's right. like uh, a miracle. Okay, You have to, to catch in that moment and not anymore. But th that moment is, uh, wow, is incredible. They gave you something that maybe they are not uh, even um, coscienti. Aware of. Uh, because they don't know. But you know. So it, it's like, uh, it's even um, a process about trust. Yeah. 
the trust is very important in this kind of work because if I trust you, I know I can, uh, I, mi posso affidare, affidare, mi posso affidare. That I can um, release myself completely. And this is uh, necessary because if I, they, they don't uh, release uh, to me, every time everyone stay in his uh, mm. own, come si dice, recinto. In his own space and of confinement. Never happen. Nothing happened. But otherwise, we, if they trust, uh, happen a lot of things, uh, and you have a, like um, alchemical process. So yes. you can catch that moment, that magic. Yes. So I alchemical, mean, alchemical because transforming, not only magic, because uh, uh, alchemy transform mm -hmm. something, and you mm -hmm. can transform that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, does this mean um, rehearsing at all? Is there any kind of rehearsal process? Or do you decide, okay, I'm going to move the camera this way, but I want to interfere with them as little as possible. So is it adapting to what's happening? Or is it, and keeping the camera running for those alchemical moments? Because it is so unpredictable. I mean, what, you, what we see, it looks so purposeful. It looks so, it looks as the way it should be. The camera was just in the right place. The, the, that's the magic part I'm thinking of, you know, that your, it, your own intuition after doing this for so long, sort of, you know, when you need that close up, you know, when you need to place the camera in a certain place. And I think, I think that's, I don't think any director really can work in that method. It's a very demanding way in which to work because you do have to be so flexible. You know, you're wearing both the hats of an orchestrator, but also a true observational person. And those two modes are very difficult to put together, I would imagine. Uh, yes, I think, I think the word you used was absolutely correct, flexible, and kind of being able to adapt to different situations or you know one of your contributors not really feel like doing it or can't do it or suddenly realize it's beyond them mm -hmm. uh, and you just have to go okay well let's think of a different way of doing it mm -hmm. I mean in that scene that we'd watched earlier with Eddie and his wife where she speaks the verses she arrived on the set and she hadn't learned anything and I said oh this is a problem then and, and then Eddie said to me took me to one side and said She's dyslexic, she can't, because I was going to put them on an auto cue, and he said she can't read it. Interesting. So I just okay. sat with her and sat with her, and we went, I stood everybody down, and we sat and we learned it together. And then she performed it beautifully. She does perform it beautifully. I mean, it's a really lovely recitation, very moving. Um, in, we just have, a, this went by so fast. <laughs> we, in the few minutes we have left, I would love to show the spectators just a little bit more of your work, if you wouldn't mind. We can close with that. Um, the last clips, which are nine and 10, um, I would love to play because uh, this um, Tia Enza, you know, you, you shot it on, was it Super 8 or Super 8? Yes, it's Super you know, 8 and digital together. Together, yes, and um, and from Brian's drinking for England. I mean, again, the the lack of let's say musical talent or whatever that your protagonists might have, but nonetheless are brave enough to step in front of the camera to to sing. And I think this would just be a lovely way to close. So, yeah. if we could play clip clips nine and ten, please. <laughs>
Have you been sober? <laughs> it's no good, you know. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, drunk's better than sober, like, like, you know, having sex is better than not having sex, you know, obviously. It goes without saying. It's what, we're, it's what most people spend their lives trying to achieve, is having a good time. A good time for working-class people is... Or for any people, is the drugs that you take. I'm a thinking man, and I like a good thing. I'm a thinking man, I like a good thing. I walk to the bar and think like a fish. I thank the good Lord for the things that I think, and I think that I'll think like this till I'm sunk. I'm a joking man, and I like to be joking. I'll joke till I'm damn nearly choking I'll strike up a light and joke like a chimney It pains me to think all the jokes I've got in me Thinking's a beautiful thing for a man Thinks from a bottle and thinks from a can Thinks from hell and straight to the brain Thinks coming down from the heavens like rain Well, I can't afford to spend all this time and all this money on drinking. Um, you know, it's me 40th me birthday today and here I am, potless. I've got no house, no car or anything else. I've spent all my money on enjoying myself. Or what I consider enjoying myself. We're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Brian and Roberta, for this wonderful talk. It was lovely to talk to you. And thank you all for Thanks coming for and coming joining along. us today. Thank you. Thank you.